Hello everyone, my name is Amy and I enjoy gaming and here we have a, another episode of Background Lore. Joining me today are... Hey, uh, I'm Liren. I'm known as Jedi Lalu. Uh, everywhere, uh, mostly you can find me on Tumblr. And apparently I'm in Amy's phone as Night Mother, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for this topic. Hey, I'm Marco. I'm known as Fembeb everywhere else. And apparently I'm on Amy's phone as Sithis, or... Dreadfather. Or Dreadfather, even better. <laughs> so, as you guys might have imagined, I brought this up last time, and just the fact that we're talking about it, we are going to talk about the Morag Tong and the Dark Brotherhood today. Which, uh, as you might have guessed, the Dark Brotherhood is a bit of a popular topic among... Well, you guys in particular, but you know me by osmosis so <laughs> we're going to start with talking about the moreg tong so who are they what's their deal and why do they stab so many people yeah so actually i'm going to kind of establish um why it is you've picked us uh to talk about this not just and, and also why probably you are have us in your phone as night mother and dread father <laughs> Um, we actually um, met as Fenbab and Jedi Lalu on, uh, oh my goodness, message boards were not Discord, um, you know, 15 years ago or so. Yeah, ye olden days. <laughs> ye olden days. Uh, we were working on uh, the Dark Brotherhood Chronicles mod that eventually came out. We didn't stick with it through to the end because we both ended up going to college and... Um, it, Pshaw, higher education. <laughs> well, I mean, it took it, it. The 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 Chronicles mod took a lot of time, and we just didn't have the time to do both, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we uh, uh, Fenbab here was the head writer for the Dark Brotherhood Chronicles uh, at the time, and uh, I found the message boards because I was just obsessed enamored i don't know when oblivion came out with the the dark brotherhood quest line so i found their message boards started posting and they're like hey we need a lore person and i was like that's great i'm studying to be a history major um so i will love to help study fictional history as well and uh yeah no that's that's kind of <laughs> how that <laughs> happened and then you know 15 years later here we are married so that's that's that story anyway. A Mark Tong then. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you uh, obviously the Dark Brotherhood is. We're going to get to that, but uh, for right now, the kind of I started with Morrowind, so kind of the first uh, guild of assassins I encountered was the Morag Tong. If from what I can remember, it's been a moment since I've played. Uh, Morrowind, but I do know that the Morag Tong were a thing, and they do come up in ESO. So yeah, they uh, they were a thing. They're probably most people's first encounter with one of the assassin guilds, although the Dark Brotherhood predates them in in game existence. The Dark Brotherhood appears in uh, Daggerfall. They're one of the secret guilds that you can join, but most people started with Morrowind, so we can start with the Morag Tong. Um, they're established as this um, legal assassins guild. Calling them assassins is almost wrong at this point. They're more like duelists for hire, if you think about it. <laughs> um, because their writs are essentially public... Uh, the public, public right. execution. Yeah, it's a public execution. So they walk up to someone, they can just walk up to them and they like, murder them in cold blood, and the guards just let them go because they have writs. Um, so they don't really have to hide, they don't really have to use poisons, or they don't really have to do any of those things. It's not illegal for them to do so, but it is also largely unnecessary. And I think that's a very weird position for an assassin guild to exist in. Um, the very few first quests that you do for them are normal assassinations, uh, normal as far as they're concerned. Um, but very quickly, the majority of the story with the Mark Tong and Morrowind is about them fighting the Dark Brotherhood, uh, which is their 
spin-off cult that is trying to go back to their homeland, which is the only place the Morag Tong have left, so they're not very keen on that either. <laughs> so, um, they are currently these duelists, but they're, um, they're founded on the principles of secret murder. Uh, you know, they, there's, there's plenty of origin myths, um, but all of the origin myths have the Daedra Mephala somehow, uh, in, you know, involved. Whether or not Mephala herself founded the Morag Tong or whether or not the Morag Tong was this cult that followed Mephala, uh, one said that they were a cult that was dedicated to both Mephala and Sithis, and we'll get to Sithis in a bit. But, you know, the Daedra Mephala is the Daedric god of, of secrets, and, you know, and murder and stuff. But um, she even appears in the, the 36 Lessons of Vivek uh, twice, actually. Um, one of them a little more uh, tame than the other reference. <laughs> but, you know, in Sermon 2, it says, yeah, and then the sixth spirit appeared, the Black Hands Mephala who taught the Vilathi at the beginning of days, the arts of sex and murder. And um, it, it, she's actually referenced, or rather, the Morag Tong is referenced by name later in Sermon 22, when Vivek you know, withdrew into the hidden places and found the darkest mothers of the Morag Tong. Um, and it's, it's talked about as them being, you know, hidden in these dark corners and this, like, secret cult that was not originally out in the open um, and and worshipping Mephala in the darkness and, and you know, underground. And, um, of course, by Morrowind, obviously, that's not the, the case because to join, well, to join the guild, it's a little more roundabout, but the first time, at least, I think the first time a lot of us see the Morag Tong is in this just random, you know, it's in this house on top of the hill behind the Hlalu uh, homestead. You go and you've joined the Hlalu and then right behind them is this house and they're like, yeah, this is where the assassins all live. Out in the open, totally public. Um, so they're obviously not, not hidden anymore. Uh, but a lot, all, of the, all of the myths, uh, all of the origins that, that you know, can be tracked are all about how they were... Um, hidden and secret and just, you know, worshippers of Mephala at that point. Well, and something that comes up in ESO when you're talking to members of the Morag Tong is they mention how uh, they just recently became legal again in Morrowind, kind of suggesting that there's this time where the Morag Tong was banned, which I thought was interesting for the Dark Elves in particular with their uh, I mean, they have an entire vengeance day. That's kind of their thing. <laughs> and also, anytime you ask, hey, can you do this? And they're like, I don't have a writ for that, so you can do it. Uh, yeah. But we're we're already kind of toeing the line here with how much we're getting involved. Do we have a writ? No. So you're on your own. So let, let me ask a question, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put forth this here. Fenbab and I haven't played yet, though. When does it take place? I know it's kind of middle of the second era. Is that? Uh, I wouldn't even, it's, uh, let me look that up. Cause it, I wouldn't even say it's middle of the second era because there is no emperor. Um, and oh, we're, right, right. we're in the, right. um, three banners war. It's more of the end of the second era. Like okay. basically you have the three factions that, uh, are vying for the throne because it is empty. Okay, so um, at the end of the first era, uh, the Tong, the Morg Tong um, murdered an emperor. Uh, I, uh, emperor Raymond III uh, was killed by the Morg Tong. And um, it, obviously this was not good. Uh, no one appreciated this. I think, I think, didn't they, didn't they murder the, another emperor right after it? And then the nobles kind of freaked out? Yeah, so they were hired, uh, honor, because at that point they were completely legal anywhere in the world. And they were hired honorably, quote unquote, to assassinate an emperor, which gave way for the Akavir to actually rule over Tamriel. Um, 
it came full circle when later they were then hired to hot to kill the akavir emperor uh descended from that but that was hundreds of years later um and that by that point it was realized by most of the nobility in the world that literally no one was safe and it was not a good idea to just have an open guild of assassins <laughs> that operated so per pervasively everywhere in their uh land so they were outlawed everywhere they were hunted down they were almost extincted and they had to go underground for a period of time and that's when the schism happens and the dark brotherhood forms after this period okay uh, i found the dates um yeah uh so elder scrolls takes place in the second era 582 so i guess there's still a few hundred years before um before tiber septum rises to the throne Yes, five. Okay, so f that's five eighty two. Uh, I found the date here. Um, the first emperor murdered was at the end of the first era. The second emperor was murdered uh, in second era two. I'm sorry, three twenty four. <laughs> it says by this point, however, the guild was overconfident and prideful, and Morag Tong was scrolled on the palace walls in his own blood. <laughs> So, uh, 324 uh, was the second emperor's death, and not too long after that is when they were, um, yeah, the the nobles kind of freaked out and um, yeah, suppressed the Morag Tong and essentially kind of beat them back into Morrowind, uh, you know, between outlawing them and, you know, just suppressing them. They, they ended up going back to Morrowind um, kind of out of sight for around a hundred years or so. And that, that political pressure is what kind of gave the Dark Brotherhood the chance to appear everywhere else. Um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Dark Brotherhood didn't really take too much power in Morrowind. Uh, they never, they tried, they, they, they really tried, uh, to establish themselves in Morrowind, but because the Morag Tong held onto that territory, they, they didn't. And you get a lot of that in, you know, Tribunal uh, expansion for the Morrow and game. But yeah, so so apparently in uh, in and after 2E 324 uh, is when is when that all happened. So Okay, if, yeah, that makes if, sense then. Yeah. So I could see, you know, if they're underground for 100 years and then they're you know, recently brought back that, that fits. Yeah. All right. Okay. So with, we talked about how they're kind of followers of Mafala, which I always found, I found that little tidbit interesting. I, I don't remember which NPC said it, uh, but they talk about how you bring up some guild of assassins and they're like, Oh, which one is that? Is that the one that, Oh, I remember now it's from, um, one of the expansions, I believe you're talking to a Daedra, and like, yeah, they're framing the Dark Brotherhood, and she's like, oh, which one is that? Is that the one that follows Mafala or the one that follows uh, Sithis? So, <laughs> uh, and that was the first time I ever heard any relation to, of Mafala, well, as far as I remember, uh, of Mafala to the uh, Morak Tong, because my memories of Morrowind are very vague, um, because I was like 12 <laughs> when I first played it. <laughs> so, and most of that time was just spent God moding my character and mm -hmm. jumping over mountains. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. Morrowind was, um, Morrowind was intense for 12 years old. Yes. <laughs> Uh, there was some instances I got myself into that I realized, oh, this isn't age appropriate. <laughs> yeah, there's not very much Morrowind that is age appropriate. <laughs> no. Um, in Morrowind, the Morak Tong is very well tied with Mephala. They've been since they've been created. Um, which then makes sense that they be tied with Vivek because Vivek is the um, anticipation of Mephala. Uh so there's two books actually that talk about when the Morag Tong was created, how they were established, and of course they're contradictory. Uh, the first book speaks that they were entirely always Mephala. Uh, it says that Mephala taught the Chimer to evade their enemies or kill them with secret murder, uh, and then in the same sentence ends it by saying that later she created the Morag Tong. 
Mm-hmm. So in one of them, and this is the older book, if we're talking about like which one came first in actual time, uh, this first appeared in Morrowind. Um, and so it's a very Mephala-centric thing. The second book, uh, the first appeared in Oblivion, this one says that the Morag Tong was always established as worshipping Mephala and Sithis. Uh, and depending on how you want to read the sentence, it, always, it also implies that Sithis comes before Mephala. Um, but it, 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 it in any case insinuates that it was always a Mephala and Sithis uh, juncted thing. Which would then explain when they go underground that the schism can happen mm-hmm. and it makes sense why the Dark Brotherhood falls Sithis. They are those people that thought the Sithis was more important than the Fala was and that they were getting away from what they were supposed to do. Whereas the Mark Tong remnant are the ones that say that Mephala was always the true aspect and they called Sithis uh, blasphemy in Morrowind. So that first book that he talked about was The Anticipations? And the second book, uh, with Fire and Darkness, was it? Yeah, Fire and Darkness, The Brotherhoods of Death. Oh, uh-huh. well, that's dramatic. <laughs> so yeah. the, that also makes me think of that verse that you read, Liren, about the black hand of and talking about that and yeah, how it's the symbol of the Dark Brotherhood is, you know, the infamous we know handprint. That's kind of what made, even though it relates to the Morag Tong, given how kind of tied up the origins of the Morag Tong and the Black Black Brotherhood, Dark Brotherhood are, um, I wonder if that's also somewhat related to that part of the Dark Brotherhood. So I'm on the UASP right now uh, looking at that. Apparently it was part of Eno Lalu's dialogue, who is the, the guild master of the Morag Tong, uh, during one of the quests in Morrowind, uh, that he calls her Black Hands Mephala. Uh, so, <laughs> Mephala being, you know, of course, one of the quote unquote good Daedra of the Tribunal Phase, <laughs> in anticipation of Vivek, um, known as Black Hands Mephala. And uh, she's, you know, the, the, the spider, she's, she's known as this in a black spider that lives in the darkness. Um, funnily enough, apparently the Khajiit call her a teaching mother and the keeper of ancient secrets. I, uh, I just saw that too. But yeah, so the black hand is, or the black hand is the um, ruling body of the Dark Brotherhood. So I guess they must have gotten that from their early days you know, as Mafala worshippers or as this splinter group, and I never really put two and two together until I started looking at this right now. That's that's pretty cool. So speaking of, like, the Black Hand and that being, like, an upper echelon mm-hmm. of the Dark Brotherhood, do we know anything about how the... Since you can join them in Morrowind, I'm, there must be some sort of, like, organization structure that the Morak Tong work by. Do we know any... What do we know about that? Well, we know that by the time uh, of Morrowind, anyway, the Grand Master is a Hlalu. Um, so they are, uh, at, at that point, especially very um, entwined in House Hlalu. Uh, part of why I fell in love with them, uh, my screen name being Jedi Hlalu. Um, and the the Hlalu themselves, you know, they're they're trying very hard to fit in with the Imperials and be like, we are the good people here because we are following Imperial law and no other house is doing it as well as we are. But they're still, they're still murdering people left and right, you know, with the Morig Tong. And you've got the Telvanni out here, you know, just kind of murdering each other with magic and out in the open and stuff. But that's, (laughs) that's, that's, that's not sanitary. You know, that's not the way the Empire would prefer to see one of their provinces operate. Um, so the uh, so House Lalu, and, and this is also illustrated by the fact that their um, their guild house is right behind the Hlalu homestead in Belmora, in the Hlalu capital of Belmora. And um, like they, I, I'm not going to call them a hand of the house, but they're a lot of their um, 
um, business is coming from that house at that point. So that that makes sense to me because if anything else, the Morik Tong is definitely a business. It's just a business of murder, and what better house to manage that than the house that deals pretty heavily with mercantilism? Yeah, absolutely. I love you know. Um, and it's funny too because okay, so if if nobody if you haven't played Morrowind, the way that you actually join the Morag Tong, you don't just walk into their guild house and say, "Yo, I want to be an assassin." You have to find their grand master and ask him. But he's, um, you know, he's not in any obvious location. You have to go to the city of Vivek. Uh, you know, go to the arena canton, go underneath the arena canton, you know, into the lower, um, the, the, the sewer areas, and there's this trapped, trap door that you have to, I, I think there's a rat in that room that I remember too, and you have to, you know, get through the trapped trap door, and then only then when you go down and they're like, aha, you have found us, you are worthy. Uh, and they take you to Eno, who lives there, um, and and then he's like, I guess since you found us, you can be one of us, and they start giving you uh, quests. That's actually uh, supposed to happen. There's a book called The Dark Darkest Darkness, I think, that talks about that. Um, the right of finding him is just how you join. And when you get to him, he's not surprised that you did that. That is how all of them joined. Um, that actually also betrays the fact that they're very contradictory. They are a business. They are very open. They have guild halls everywhere. They have guild halls and the Thieves' Guild doesn't. That's how weird it is. But at the same time, they're extremely cult-like because that's how they were founded. All of their ranks you were talking about before, mechanically speaking, it's a straight line all the way up, which is how all of the Morrowind ones work. Um, but they all have titles like Thrall or Brother or Knower. They're extremely cult-like all of the time, but they're trying very hard to like privatize into a business. <laughs> and it's a very weird experience to watch them do it. It sounds like, like an MLM oh, yeah. tier. It, 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 it's almost like if a cult also was a supermarket. It's like you walk in and you're like, I would like three blessings. Uh, oh, and a curse, please, because oh, why not? And they're like, oh, that's five five ninety nine, please. It's funny, but that, it's still the same thing. It's funny that the joining process for the Morg Talk is uh, you find them, while the joining process for the Dark Brotherhood is they found you. Yeah, I, I found the ranks, by the way, and I had forgotten that after the the first rank you get after associate is not thrall, it's blind thrall. So he goes blind thrall, thrall, white thrall, thinker, brother, knower, master, exalted master, and grandmaster. And if that doesn't sound like John Oliver talking about emerald and double diamonds in an MLM, I don't know what does. <laughs> No, that, that's exactly what it sounds like. A recruit uh, five uh, more assassins underneath you, and you can move up to the next rank. <laughs> Instead of recruit, it's kill. Yeah. And honestly, that is less predatory than MLMs usually are. Uh, uh, this message brought to you by people who are tired of our ex-classmates telling us about <laughs> wonderful, you know... Well, I guess J J Fenbad probably hasn't experienced that, but... I know I have. Yeah, that's the. I don't. I don't know how prevalent of a problem that is in Brazil, but. <laughs> uh, actually, terribly so. Oh, oh no! It's even worse. Of but, course um, it is. Back to the good MLM, which yeah. is murder. <laughs> um, you mentioned the the Dark Brotherhood finding you. Multi-level um, murder. It's... Sorry. Multi-level <laughs> murder. Um, it's funny because. It, again, they're both very similar. You have to do a trial to join the Morak Tong. No other um, guild does this in Morrowind. Uh, not even the Great Houses do this. Uh, the Morak Tong is the only one that's like, no, no, they're, they're, something needs to be special for you, for you to be a part of us. And for the Dark Brotherhood, it's the same thing. It's just, it depends on which one the, uh, which one that individual organization values most. The Morak Tong values discretion and detective work. 
because you're gonna have to find these people because if writs are open you know if you have one on your head <laughs> so you're not going to be sitting in the bar just waiting unless you're a red run but you know um <laughs> most people are going to run and they need you to be able to find them on the other hand the what the dark brotherhood values most of all is just blood so to join in any version of them that is joinable you have to do the same thing. And it actually started much more brutal than now. For Oblivion and for Skyrim, all you have to do is kill one person. In Arena, you had to kill 15 guards or three people. 15 guards. 15 guards had to die. Because guards count less than in innocent people for some reason. You had to kill 15 guards guards or killed three innocent people before they sent you a bloody letter now granted in oblivion uh they will also send you a letter even if you haven't murdered anyone in cold blood mm -hmm. if you become the arena grandmaster you also get the note or er, the note of you are being watched by unseen forces oh interesting so that's a bug related to a quest though it's because really? yeah so so it's because if you do the quest for the great prince who's the arena grand champion uh, you find out that he's not half uh, something else. He's half vampire. And so when you tell him this, he is so distraught that when you fight him in the arena, he does not attack you ever and instead st stands there and says, kill me. You know I deserve this. Please kill me. And that counts as murder. I didn't even think about it that way. But yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes more sense. Well, see, the one of the times that I got the message in Oblivion of you've been your murder has been witnessed by unknown forces was actually when I was doing Shivering Isles, and I don't remember what quest it was, but you had like joined <laughs> one of the forces of like the Golden Saints or whatever the other ones were, and you had to attack the their fortress of the opposing side. So I was doing that doing a quest where I had to murder Daedra and I got that message that popped up and I'm like uh <laughs> yeah, oh that's, no that's never been known to be stable one of my favorite bugs <laughs> in Oblivion is uh, talking about the Dark Brotherhood again instead of receiving a letter in Oblivion you receive a visit from Lucien Lachance well one of the quests in Oblivion is also to go to sleep and wake up in some guy's dream, yeah. which is this dreamland where nothing makes sense and no geometry exists. Well, if you murder someone and then start that quest, <laughs> Lucien Lachance still appears in this dude's dream to tell you that, hey, we have a great invitation to the Dark Brotherhood. Um, oh, Bethesda. And then, and then, that's not, so after he gives you his whole spiel, you know, he casts invisibility on himself and walks away. Well, in the dream cell, he can't get out. So he, like, <laughs> casts invisibility on himself and then crouches in a corner because there's no exit from that cell. And if you go and you talk to him anyway, because you can still talk to him while he's invisible, he'll be like shush not here we'll meet or talk you know whatever later in the sanctuary um and you could just do that over and over because you can't leave <laughs> i had a friend who when she was playing morrowind and trying to join not morrowind but oblivion uh, and she was trying to join the dark brotherhood she went to some random person's house and of course killed them but made sure to kill them at the top of the stairs and she wanted to make sure their body landed just right <laughs> At the bottom oh, no. of the stairs. And I'm like, oh, oh, Sylvia, that is... You're a salutatorian. Why are you so demented? I was salutatorian. <laughs> it must be... Okay, so now we know there's something wrong with all salutatorians ever. <laughs> uh, so check on your local salutatorian today. We're the cool <laughs> one. We're the cool one. You gotta make it look like an accident. Otherwise, what's the point? Of course. It's... <laughs> So we've kind of transitioned to talking about the Dark Brotherhood. So why don't we go ahead and, and we kind of discussed that, you know, they've pretty much started as a splinter cell of uh, the Morag Tong, with the Morag Tong being more Mafala based and her being in a Daedra. And one of these days we'll talk about the Daedra sometime eventually, maybe. So, but the Dark Brotherhood is more in line with Sithis. So... Who is Sithis? 
just like your local salutatorian, Sithis is the cool one. <laughs> so I, I love Sithis. Sithis is one of my favorite um, mythological creatures, you know, from fiction or not. Sithis is nothing. Sithis is the primordial void from which everything is created. Sithis is what existed before the Big Bang, essentially. And um, only in the Elder Scrolls world, uh, the Big Bang was essentially Sithis dreaming. Sithis was the original dreamer. And it, it, the, the imbi- so it, it's also interesting in that um, Sithis is not necessarily uh, anthropomorphized by all of the people that worship him, it, thing. Um, he, Sithis can just be this natural force in the universe or natural anti-force in the universe. Sometimes you know, he is attributed to having a will, but my favorite interpretation of Sithis's will is like the um, comparing it to when you mix oil and water, it'll always separate. There's this physical force that the water and the oil you say they want to separate uh, and that's kind of what Sithis's will is in my interpretation anyway um, so but the story goes the story goes is that in the beginning there was absolutely nothing uh, and that nothing was Sithis and then Sithis dreamt and his dreams became so vivid and real that his dreams eventually took shape and formed creation and uh Sithis did not appreciate this that was like you know Sithis is sitting here going zero out of ten worst decision ever and ever since that moment he has wanted it all to go back to being the void so you know the fact that he dreamed up creation and you know everything kind of took off after that the the Adra were created. This is why also Sithis is not considered Adric. He's definitely not considered Daedric because he's well before that. Um, but he, the 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 myth is that he dreamt up the Adra and all of all of creation. Um, so, yeah, he, he he's also kind of relegated uh, in the games at this point to like the realm beyond Oblivion and Aetherius. Uh, um, kind of where the vestiges of you know the banished go to to just kind of be. Uh, the Dark Brotherhood is very big about believing that the souls of those that they've killed in the name of Sithis go back to the void. So really, the Dark Brotherhood, eh, when you think of it that way, they're kind of a doomsday cult. You know, they mm-hmm. they are attempting to help Sithis decreate reality if if you if you talk to the more religious members uh and the more religious npcs like lucian lachance um you you kind of get this idea that they when they say they send souls to the void they literally mean that they are helping him murder creation and their end goal is essentially the death of everything and the return to this state of void because the other thing is that the creation that sith has you know made is is chaotic and it's unbalanced and it's constantly like you know when when you think about um matter in general with with molecules and atoms and constant vibrating of of you know waves and strings if string theory is right you know that's a lot of noise (laughs) and Sithis does not like any of it he just wants it quiet again so the Dark Brotherhood is kind of legit like this doomsday cult Um, whether or not they believe in that they're using that as the you know mythological reason behind let's murder everyone but you know we got to do it for money because capitalism (laughs) well if they're since they want everything to return to the void, why limit themselves to only victims um, ordered by the Black Sacrament? Um, I, I think that's part of the 
you know, organization, we have to be capitalistic about this. <laughs> Jeez, they, capitalism just ruins everything, including I doomsday know. cults. Right? Um, I mean, they they would absolutely have seen what happened to the Morag Tong when the Morag Tong murdered mm. uh, uh, the emperor and then the next emperor, which is, let me tell you something, part of what I have a problem with with the Skyrim, but that's just... <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> No, so, um, you know, there's some obvious rules, and every guild has to have at least some rules, and that's where we get the, the five, um, oh my god, what do you call them? Five tenants. The five tenants. You know, you, you shouldn't murder your fellow dark brothers and sisters. You shouldn't steal from your dark brothers and sisters. You gotta have some rules, even in a doomsday cult. Um, and they, they, they would have seen what happened to the Morig Tong when murdering the emperors and when getting the nobility all, you know, hot and bothered about, oh my god, we might be next. So in order to stay uh, alive as a religion or as a cult, they had to go underground um, and stay secret, just like, you know, early Morig Tong, the secret hands of Mephala. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, that's fun too some some people say the original night mother who the night mother is uh the the eh, i was gonna say mortal but not mortal but on this plane uh in this realm leader of the dark brotherhood um some some myths say that the original night mother was mafala so you had like that um kind of tie back in there the secrecy and everything uh, so they have to weigh their own survival with um, the will of Sithis. I'm sure if if Sithis absolutely willed it, they would destroy everything. But they they need to also survive as a guild in order to carry out those, yeah, jobs. Well, they also <laughs> came from structure, and religious structure is just so natural. There's so much power in ritual. They need to keep those people you know, motivated, and they also know that they don't have enough people to kill everyone. There's no point in starting a war with everyone and then just getting wiped out. This is true. So, uh, we, so I, I would like to point out, um, if, if, so long as we're talking about Sithis from a religious point of view, some of my favorite dialogue is talking to the more religious people in the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion. Um, actually, some of my favorite dialogue just comes from the Dark Brotherhood <laughs> in general. <laughs> uh, but so it w if you can ask all of the members that you run into in Oblivion about Sithis. And so Vicinti Veltieri is the, um, the vampire in the Oblivion Sanctuary. And when you ask him about Sithis, he says, Sithis is the darkness of time immemorial. He has no Daedra and dwells not in the realm of Oblivion. No, Sithis is something altogether different. Um, and uh, when you talk to Lucian Lachance, who's the head of that sanctuary, um, he says, How does one best describe our dread father? Imagine a perfect cloudless midnight, cold as winter ice and shrouded in shadow. That is is Sithis. Um, if you ask Grogren, he says that he doesn't care and he's just happy that Sithis lets him murder people, uh, which is also endearing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, so, so yeah, th those are so poetic and so obviously devout that that, that alone kind of gives you a, a good idea of, of the attitudes of the people who belong to his cult. So we kind of touched on the Night Mother a little bit, but let's talk about more about her because she's just, she's another very kind of important aspect of the Dark Brotherhood. You know, at, at one side you have the Dread Father, but, you know, the Dark, the Night Mother is also a pretty important aspect of the, the cult. I, I was going to say guild, but yeah, at this point, yeah, they're, they're, it's just a cult. Yeah, the, the thing about the Brotherhood that is interesting is that they appear in four of the five mainline games. So they ended up changing a lot. The Night Mother started as a rank, uh, from what we can tell. 
uh, the first time that you see them is in the Dark Bar it's in the Dark Brotherhood in uh, Daggerfall that you can join, and she's just there. In Morrowind, you can only join the Marak Tong, but the Marak Tong are of course fighting with the Dark Brotherhood because they just keep trying to go into uh, Morrowind, and you do have an NPC in that um, game that is called a Regional Night Mother, which then makes you think that there's maybe like one for each of the countries or something like that it's a it looks very organized organized and, and commercial um it's not until oblivion that the night mother becomes a myth and as a myth she is then no longer a rank but a creature in uh, oblivion she's a spirit of an actual woman that lived a long time ago um and in Skyrim, you still deal with that same spirit through her embalmed corpse. That is very well maintained. Very well oiled. <laughs> embalmed corpse. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to find it here. There was a book by a character named Gaston Bellefort. And... Um, one of the books is called The Night Mother's Truth. And this is... Uh, oh, I found it. Okay. So, Bellefort, or Bellefort, whatever, however you pronounce it, he's a, he's a Breton, so it's the French pronunciation, um, writes about potentially meeting the Night Mother. Uh, I think that's the one, anyway. Um, actually, yeah. Uh, or or maybe, maybe that's not there... Mm, now I'm reading it and I'm mixing up, but there there is a book that talks about actually meeting the Night Mother or a Night Mother, and uh, that person ends the book by saying, um, you know, they're probably going to be dead by the time you read this because they have, uh, you know, been discovered and they're running and meeting the Night Mother is not a good, and knowing who she is is not good for one's health. Um, and that book took place in uh, Hammerfall. So, I, I, and now that I've looked up the one by Bellafort, this is uh, not the one I was thinking of. Um, but the reason Bellafort stuck in my head is because he did he did write a book about the Night Mother, and he lays out that um, this is a Skyrim book, by the way. Uh, he lays out that he, the Night Mother is accessed by speaking to the lucky old lady in Breville, um, and essentially tells you what we learn about the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion. Uh, his corpse is found in the actual Dark Brotherhood sanctuary in Skyrim, um, because he had become so obsessed with researching the truth of the Night Mother that he did find their sanctuary, made it into their sanctuary, um, and and was stupid enough to walk in. I was gonna like, say that obviously turned out well for him. Yeah, no, I'm I'm gonna go back and try to find that other book that I uh, am thinking about because oh now it's in my head. Oh no, <laughs> Sacred Witness. I think that was it. Yeah, Sacred Witness. This was a book that was in Oblivion, um, and uh, it's written by Enric Milriz. Uh, and it's a, an account of his meeting with the Night Mother. And he gets to, like, interview her a little bit. And, um, uh, you know, they talk, they even talk about the Morag Tong. Uh, and the Night Mother says that the Morag Tong was around long before my time. I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. I merely, hire, I merely hired on some of their assassins when they began to fall apart after their murder of the last emperor. Uh, they did not want to be members of the Tong anymore, and since I was the only other murder syndicate of any note, they just joined on. And uh, I phrased my next question carefully. Will you kill me now that you've told me all of this? She nodded sadly, letting out a little grandmotherly sigh. You're such a nice, polite young man. I hate to end our acquaintanceship. I don't suppose you would agree to a concession or two in exchange for your life, would you? <laughs> To my everlasting shame, I did agree. I said that I would say nothing about our meeting, which, as the reader can see, I was pr a promise I eventually, years later, chose not to keep. Why have I endangered my life thus? Because of the promises I did keep. 
I helped the Night Mother and the Dark Brotherhood, an axe too despicable, too bloody for me to set to paper. My hand quivers as I think about the people I betrayed, beginning with that night. I tried to write my poetry, but ink seemed to turn to blood. Finally, I fled, changing my lane, going to a land where no one would know me. And I wrote this, the true history of the Night Mother, from the interview she gave me on the night we met. It will be the last thing I ever write, this I know, and every word is true. Pray for me. Uh, so this wow. describes... <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's called Sacred Witness. Uh, again, a book in Oblivion, also in Skyrim, apparently also in ESO. Um, but this guy, so that's, you know, talking about a Night Mother, a, a real flesh and blood person with the rank of Night Mother. Um, and the fact that it appeared in Oblivion uh, is, you know, it, it's interesting to me because in Oblivion, it's also shown what the truth is at that point of... She is this ghost that does listen to um, prayers. Uh, she does pay attention to the Black Sacrament. She uh, did murder her five children in the name of Sithis to send him to Sithis. And yet also in Oblivion, we have this book about a flesh and blood night mother from when it was a rank. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of maybe the writers trying to bridge that gap between what we saw in Daggerfall and Morrowind, and then what we what we came to know in Oblivion. Um, I needed to bring that story in, though, because I, I absolutely loved that book. No, that's it, a good one. Yeah. One day I'll get around to doing a lore listening library for Elder Scrolls, but that's, that's a project. <laughs> uh, there's some fantastic books in these games, though. Uh, I forget the name of it. Was it the, the one with the arrow um do you remember the one i'm talking about one of the black arrows but i don't remember which one three maybe yeah or there's six. there's this assassin uh and every day he um shoots an arrow and he shoots it perfectly uh into this locked room and it ends up in the eye of a portrait of this person and it drives the guy whose portrait it is absolutely insane. And they have to, like, he's like, how is this doing this? Who is sending me this message? Um, you know, and they end up locking the room and posting guards outside of the room so that nobody can come in and shoot this arrow into this portrait every more, anymore. But every single day at... Yeah, was it the same time? I don't even remember. Every single day, this arrow ends up in this portrait, and the guy becomes more and more paranoid until... Um... Wait, do, do you remember exactly how it went down? Yeah, it was always at the same time, and they kept adding more and more guards around the, the perimeter, and it kept not working. And the only thing that anyone would ever notice was a whooshing sound. So eventually the owner of the manor gets so paranoid that they go into the room with the portrait. They wait until the time happens. But that night, for whatever reason, they don't hear a whooshing sound. When they think that they should have heard a whooshing sound, they try to unlock the door, they fiddle with their key, but the key won't go into the lock, so they put their eye to the keyhole to see what's wrong, and the arrow goes through the keyhole into their eye. Yeah... That was that was a good one too. Um, that was it. There's some fantastic books in these, uh, and that's a skill book for archery. Of course it is. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that got a little off topic, but <laughs> the Night Mother, um, going from you know Mephala to being an honorary or not uh, rank within the Brotherhood itself to being maybe uh, local leaders of different guilds and different provinces, to Oblivion being the actual ghost of the actual founder, um, to being the corpse that we see in Skyrim. So do we know anything else about the five children other than the fact that mommy murdered them? I, I don't think so i know that that's where the brotherhood got the idea of the five fingers for well i mean of course it could also have been um 
the whole black hand thing, the four fingers and the thumb. Uh, actually, mate, ne- mm, there were five children. Black hands, Mephala, five fingers. That, so, that might be. I've say, never thought of that. Yeah, could it be more of a reference to the fact that they cut themselves off from Mephala? That could very well be it. In fact, I really like that interpretation. <laughs> well, hey, we thought of something new. <laughs> yeah. The um, um, So there's actually, in the Night Mother's Crypt, in Oblivion, there is a skeleton of a, of a, a human a, adult skeleton with five baby skeletons uh, arranged around her and a bunch of nightshade flowers um, that's kind of macabre right there. Um, I mean, we're talking about assassins, so... I mean, that's true. That's true. But, um... Who knows? I, I mean, in Oblivion, that might supposed to be... Might be... Su- might supposed to be her body, uh, but it could absolutely just be symbolic at that point. Um, although... Although, you know, that could also be the... Well, that could be the corpse that's seen in Skyrim. It's just a skeleton in Oblivion, but, you know, I'm not going to fault them for having different models for the same body. So we talked about the organization structure of the Morig Tong. So uh, let's go into the organization structure of the Brotherhood. So at least within Cyrodiil, because... Uh, I, unlike, unlike Venbab, I haven't played Daggerfall. I, I really need to. Um, I haven't played, I mean, I, I know the stories of Arena and Daggerfall. I just haven't actually played the games. Um, but with it, Oblivion, uh, there are four, the, the, so the black hand is made of the four um, fingers and a thumb, they say. So four speakers and these four people are in charge you're led to believe that each one of them's in charge of a sanctuary um realistically speaking they're probably in charge of more than one each uh so lucian lachance is the character that you meet and everybody you know meets and loves (laughs) and he is in charge of the shaden hall sanctuary to which the player character belongs um, he doesn't actually live in the sanctuary. He lives outside of it, which is part of what makes me believe that he might oversee more than just one. Um, also, it, it occurs to me that if you're trying to operate within the Imperial province, you probably need more than four sanctuaries made up of like five people each. I'm sure there's a lot more operatives that you have throughout the, the province. But, uh, so yeah, no, each, each speaker oversees at least one sanctuary. And then, uh, the listener will go to the statue of the lucky old lady, which is right above the Night Mother's crypt. And the Night Mother has listened to the prayers of everyone within, uh, Tamriel, really. I mean, in Oblivion, of course, everything is restricted to Cyrodiil, but she, she listens to everybody. And if somebody commits a black sacrament, which is the prayer and ritual that you have to do to summon the Dark Brotherhood and request for somebody to appear to, um, you know, negotiate a murder, (laughs) then she will hear the black sacrament being, you know, said, uh, and she will tell the listener that, hey, uh, there's this dude over in, uh, I don't know, Coral, that wants to talk or that wants to want somebody murdered so the listener will get the list of names give the list of names to their speakers and then the speakers will go out and essentially do the negotiations so he will say okay um you know there's somebody i don't think coral is really lucian's territory there's someone in chaden hall that wants someone dead uh and he'll tell lucian who it is Lucian will be the one, because he's the speaker of that region, to go negotiate. Okay, you know, this is this is what we do. This is how much you got to pay us. This is what's going on. They they uh, do the deal. They commit the contract. And then he goes and gives that contract to the nearest sanctuary. And, the you know, the sanctuary head, 
at that point will distribute it to whatever operative they believe would do the best job. Um, so in Chaden Hall, you know, that's a Chiva. She runs it kind of side by side with Vicinti uh, as a as a head operative. And um, so so there's there's a long, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy here. You got the Night Mother that goes to the listener, that goes to the speaker, that goes to the head of the sanctuary that then deploys the operative. Um, now, for much more special cases, uh, each speaker has a silencer, which is uh, a, a rank that is pretty unknown within the Dark Brotherhood. It's a secret rank. Um, so the way Lucian describes it is that just as every finger has a nail, so every speaker has a silencer. And you know, you, you learn this because you become his silencer. Uh, so if it's a particularly special case, uh, he might bypass the sanctuary entirely and send his personal assassin out to take care of a contract. Uh, and you find also that speakers, um, well, silencers rather, you know, they, they have special jobs. Um, and they also become... Uh, they're, they're essentially his personal assassin. So, and that's not that Lucian can't go assassinate people himself. I'm sure he absolutely delights in it. But what for when he's too busy, you know, he, he can send his own silencer. Yeah, one of the first missions is he sends you like to the middle of the mountains to kill some person. <laughs> Do you think he wants to go halfway across the world on <laughs> a horse just to kill a person? Nah, just send you. That's true. A uh, good way to know you have a good manager is <laughs> delegation. So that, blessing that whole process just makes me think, whose idea was it for the murder house? <laughs> that is the best quest that has ever existed like, in an it, Elder Scrolls game ever. Was it just the Night Mother being like, okay, listen, <laughs> we got all of these people in the same area. <laughs> just put them all in the same house and we can get all these contracts done, you know. At once. At I don't once. know. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's the Night Mother. That that really sounds like, you know, just something. Oh, God. <laughs> just the person that lets you in. The person that's at the doorman at the house in Whodunit is like, uh, we have the same mother, you and I. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're obviously Dark Brotherhood from Skingrads' own uh, thing, um, Sanctuary. And they are jealous. They want to be the one in there doing this. They're like, man, you're going to have all the fun. Why it was given to you instead of him or one of his sanctuary, I'm not too sure. Because it seems like if there's a sanctuary in Skingrad, it would probably have gone to them. Uh, but yeah, no, I love that quest. Now we do know also because of Oblivion that canonically the Brotherhood will take special requests. In mm -hmm. the sense that if you want... Uh, like all of the contracts in Oblivion have a bonus if you do something in a particular way. I mean, if you just go and kill the target, you get your money, and that's fine. But if you kill the target in a specific way, then like you get more Like dropping a hunting money. trophy on their head? Exactly, drop, dropping a, a, a trophy, um, hunting trophy on their head, or in one of the cases, switching medicine with poison without being seen by anyone or attacking anyone. Um, without knocking anyone out or anything like that, you have to be completely unseen. Like, they, there's a quest about saving a guy's life. Uh, now granted, in that specific case, the Brotherhood demanded a life in exchange for his, which he happily paid with his mother. <laughs> and by the way, that was a Lucian kill. He takes that one. Yeah, I was gonna say, you remember Lucian has said, he's like, I have seen to that aspect. Yeah, he takes that personally. You go to the mountain to kill the arc with six swords and one million strength and he gets the guy's mother <laughs> um but yeah uh, so but the, the brotherhood will take special special requests so who then it could completely i can completely see it as someone uh being for whatever reason wanting to torture these people before they died and they make this law house and then the request that the assassin torment them before ending it oh my god you know i would i would believe that the brotherhood would have taken that one at a discount because they would have gone like oh hell Buy yeah that sounds awesome 
<laughs> uh, there's this um, Neil Gaiman short story. Uh, I think it's called "I'll Get Some Like I I'll Get That for You Wholesale" or something. Um, and in it, the guy just can't resist a deal. He you know he's all about deals, and he comes across this one guy. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've read the story, but essentially, um, you know, the guy's off is like, "Hey, I can kill this person for you." But at a slightly at a slightly discounted price, I could kill two people for you. And so he's like, oh, so he hymns and haws. He's like, you know, I only want the one person dead. But, you know, the price of getting two people killed is, you know, such a good deal. And so every time he goes back to that salesperson, the salesperson's like, oh, well, you know, we now have this deal of, like, if you get five people killed, then, you know, you get this even better price. And eventually the story ends with the guy calling up the salesperson. It's like, uh, how, well, you know, if you, with all these discounts and all this, like, sales and specials and all that, how much would it be to wipe out the entire world? <laughs> <laughs> and the salesperson's the just like, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically how the story ends. So I, I wanted I wanted to say I wanted to say because uh, Fenbab keeps referencing a quest where Lucian sends you to a mountain. Um, Lucian doesn't send you to the mountain. That's one of the quests you do as his silencer. But um, I think what you're thinking of is one of the uh, false dead drops, because the Nord that you kill up on up on the mountain was a silencer of the Brotherhood. Uh, so oh, the, that's after you get yeah you know, your bed drops get switched okay. yeah which I love I oh god that that just and here we can start getting a little bit into why the Dark Brotherhood from Oblivion was so much better yeah. than Skyrim we're we're at a great transition um, point for that so yeah ha, tell us all about your thoughts and feelings uh, about Oblivion versus Skyrim Dark Brotherhood Oblivion was just so well written it was it, it breaks your heart. At, at one point and then it um you know and, and then it the player character legitimately does not know what's going on uh at towards the end so you, you're everything's going around and everything's great and you're meeting all of these characters with all of this fantastic dialogue and you know it, even even the annoying characters in the sanctuary are uh lovable um, yeah, Antonetta Marie is is like this Sithis fangirl that tries to be nice and help everybody and apparently cooks for everybody. Even though Vicinti is allergic to garlic, she accidentally poisons him, <laughs> but she's still endearing, you know, and, and you really get to just love these characters. And at one point after after like eight quests, you've spent eight quests with these people. Uh you are asked by Lucian to murder the entire sanctuary. And I, I remember the first time I did that. I remember all of you know, the last time I've done that. It, it hurts every time because I love these characters so much. Uh, but you have to go and he's like, you know, we've been infiltrated. And uh, it, ha it started before you got here. So you're the only one I can trust. Um, and it was just this this shock of of oh god you know and then when you do go back and and kill the the people in the brotherhood they're like brother why or sister no and to me the 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 worst one is vicinti because he's been there for 300 years and at, it, depending on what's happened between you um he might have even turned you into a vampire of his own lineage so that was that was that was sad. Um, we have to get into a little bit of the nitty gritty of why you get so attached to them, because it will be important when we get to Skyrim. Um, you don't just walk into the the sanctuary, entirely past all of these people, straight into the quest giver, receive an assassination target, leave, do the assassination target, and then come back and get money. It never just works that way. And they keep changing who's giving you the quest. They keep changing where the quest came from. 
So they start interweaving their backstory into it. So you, their first couple of missions are just, hey, there's a pirate. Go have a fun pirate killing adventure. And then there's something else. And then one of the third or fourth missions actually comes from one of your brothers who wants you to kill a shadow scale. And the reason he can't do it is because he is a shadow scale. So you get to learn about shadow scales. You get to learn that him and Achiever are brothers uh, or siblings. You get to learn that they are shadow scales. You, every time you go back to the sanctuary, they direct you to a different person. They let you talk to them and, and they interweave their stories in such a way that it doesn't really matter if you're trying you're going to learn about them and you're going to feel like you're interacting with all of them. You're also encouraged to talk to them all about your uh, contract. So like, you know, you get this contract for the uh, pirate captain and you can go around and ask people, you know, hey, I've got this contract, what do you think? And they're like, oh man, pirates, yeah. And they'll have, uh, you know, somebody will say, you know, I bet you could sneak in through a crate. Or, you know, here's my opinion on how you would be able to do this. Um, or, hey, there was this one time that I did something kind of similar to that. And they just, they wrote so much dialogue for for this group that, that just brings you into this family. And that's another thing. When you first come in, they're like... Oh, hey, welcome to our newest brother or sister, depending on what you're playing. You know, uh, welcome. We're a family. This is great to have when you. When you're here, you're family. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that you have to then go and murder all of them is, you know, it, it's it's like, because here's the thing, too. There is a purification that you have to uh, do in Skyrim. Uh, at some point, the quest becomes, you know, they, they kind of rehash that because the writers didn't have any other ideas, I guess. But you are not attached to the characters in Skyrim because there just is not this amount of, of dialogue and writing and, and interweaving of anything. It's like, oh, I have to go murder the Shadow Scale in the Skyrim um, uh, sanctuary, I've exchanged maybe two words with the guy. Like, I, I just cannot find it in my heart to care as much. You forgot. That you, you actually don't kill any of them. You, you do that if you want to skip that quest. What I'm saying is in Skyrim, you get to the sanctuary and everyone's already been murdered. It's yeah. supposed to be like a oh no, my family died when I was gone. What you're talking about is when... You can skip the Dark Brotherhood entirely in Skyrim if you just go to the Sanctuary and kill everyone. That's right. I, you know what? I, I, I conflated it because when you get the Ghost of Lucian, who we can cover in a second, he's, one of his lines of dialogue is, what this Sanctuary needs is a good purification. This is, this is, I have played this quest a bunch of times and I legit didn't remember. Like, that's how yeah, yeah. unmemorable all of that is. So, so later on, after you viciously murder all of your friends and they all go, Brother, why? Um, Lucian starts giving you quests because you are promoted to his silencer. And he's like, okay, the first thing, uh, there's this necromancer that's trying to achieve immortality. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult, you have to sneak in, you have to steal his um, phylactery. It's really a cool quest. And so you don't go back to Lucian, you go to dead drops that are prearranged. And uh, the next one um, that you have to do is uh, you have to essentially murder an entire family, which, fun story. Um, uh, what were they called? What were they called? Uh, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm sorry. Draconis. The Draconis family. And... Um, you have to you have to kill all of them. There's five of them, uh, and it's excuse me. You 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 get told where they are and stuff. There is uh, one member of the Draconis family that will spawn before you get the quest. Uh, she lives in her home called Apple Watch outside of Coral. It's the, the matriarch of the family. Uh, I just looked it up. It's Perenia Draconis. And she is 
the one character in the game, the entire Oblivion game, that you can murder to get into the Dark Brotherhood that does not, like, that would have been killed anyway. Um, so I, I, I have used her a couple of times on my nicer playthroughs where I still wanted to join the Dark Brotherhood and, and not murder a, as many people as I possibly could outside of quests. Uh, you can go and you can kill her and use her as your entry into the Brotherhood um, because she spawns before the quest spawns. So, yeah, you go and you do that. But then, but then, uh, you go to your next dead drop and I didn't notice it the first time through, but the uh, handwriting on, on the note from Lucian has changed. And you are sent off on a mission very much like the old one, you know? You have to... It it's, goes on harder and harder, um, you know, quests to murder these people at the behest of Lucian. But you realize uh, after Lucian catches up to you, after like five more missions, by the way, that uh, these are not things that he's been quests he has been giving you. The dead drop was switched. You've been working for someone else, and you've been killing off the black hand. So, uh, you uh, end up taking out let me see, two silencers and two um, um, two silencers and one uh, speaker. So, Alva Luvani is a Dunmer. He's the speaker for God, I want to say he lives in Leowin. And then that Nord that Fenbad was talking about was a silencer. Uh, the um, There's another silencer that you kill. And then you're the last person before Lucian interrupts you um, is going, oh no, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, you do murder the speaker or the, the listener. The last thing after before Lucian interrupts you is you <laughs> literally just kill the listener of the Dark Brotherhood in Brazil uh, as he's listening to the lucky old lady, which is a night mother. I and so. um, I think the last you do end up getting the last dead drop. It was for uh, oh my goodness, what was her name? Arquin. Um, it was going to be for Arquin. And uh, yeah, Lucian comes to you and he's like. OMG, what have you done? This is awful. You know, what are you doing, you traitor? And you're like, what do you mean? I've just been following your orders. And he realizes, oh shit, okay, uh, someone's hijacked you. It's okay, everything's fine. We're gonna fix this. Um, let me go, let me go do some things and I will meet you back at Apple Watch where you, where you first killed that woman. Um, the one who had spawned before all of the quests. And you're like, okay, okay, you know, sure, I'll get there as soon as I can, you do your thing, and we'll fix this. And we get there, and he's dead. And it just, like, the twists and turns in this entire quest line, up into to the point where, you know, oh no, you, uh, you have to... to get evidence. So he does. at this point, he and you are both, because they think it's him sending you. Um, the Black Hand thinks it's him sending you, killing people. So he's being hunted. Um, and you don't know this, but you're also being hunted, but you're just going around assassinating people happily. Um, and so when Lucian eventually does meet you, he says he knows who it is, and he sends you to get evidence on their house. It's one of the speakers. You go to their house, you go to the basement, you learn that they their mother was killed by Lucien Lachasse uh, as a contract. He has never gotten over this. He eventually infiltrated the Brotherhood with the specific intention of killing the Night Mother and destroying the cult forever. Um, and the only way that he would ever get to the Night Mother is if they needed to perform a sacrament to bring her spirit if the listener was dead. Uh, you also find out that he kept his mother's head in the basement. Um, and by the way, there's a special line of dialogue that most people have never heard in Oblivion related to that head. 
because you can pick it up. Yeah. And if you pick that head up and you take it all the way to when you finally do meet this NPC and you drop the head on the ground, only then he will say, was that a head? That's it. That's the secret line. It's him saying, was that a head? That is the entirety of the thing, but I don't know why they made it so elaborate. Yeah, oh no, I mean, he, he, he's, he's legitimately distressed. He's like, is that, is that a head? And none of the other speakers will uh, react to this, but I, I, I've always, you, you gotta pick up the head just <laughs> because it's this gangly green looking thing to it. Gross. So when you do eventually get the evidence, you rush back to where Lashan's told to me, uh, told you to meet him, and the rest of the Black Hand is there. They killed him, and flayed him, and he is displayed upside down from the ceiling. They've also possibly eaten some of him. Yeah, and As this you do. game launched PG thirteen. I would like to remind you of this. <laughs> weren't they going for they were going for an M rating weren't they and they were or no no they sorry no, it was the they opposite wanted they wanted a T rating um, that's why the blood faded and, and all of that they wanted a T rating um, and when the game came out the, the industry was like what what yeah. and they ended up getting the M rating and then when it came, came time to make Shivering Isles they're like okay screw it they went all the way to the limit of that M. It was glorious. Shivering Owls is fantastic. I love Shivering Owls. <laughs> um, yeah, so so all of this glorious, glorious writing. Now, I heard or and or read that part of what happened between Oblivion and Skyrim was that some of the writers left. Uh, specifically, the writers that worked on the Dark Brotherhood and the Thieves Guild uh, left to go work on the Thief game. Um, so uh, we literally lost the geniuses behind those two quest lines. Um, and it shows, you know, it's uh, because when you get to when you get to Skyrim, I mean, I'm not even going to go into there are long videos on everything that's wrong with the Thieves Guild. We do not need to rehash all of that. But you know, the, the whole Skyrim Thieves Guild, or Dark Brotherhood rather, can be summed up in A, it's just not as much effort was put into the writing. Um, you don't get attached to the characters. You you don't, like, there's just nothing to really draw you in. And, and B, the penultimate quest of the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim is to murder an emperor, which, as we covered at the beginning of this whole session, um, is what killed the Morag Tongue for not just a couple of centuries, but pushed them out of most of the Empire and made them retreat back into their homeland. So... Eh? It does the same thing again. And also, isn't there... That's, like... that's the part that irritates me. So, um, they immediately get what you're talking about. Uh, they should never... When she takes that contract... And you start preparing for the assassination of the emperor. Um, you are all like they're already dead. And when you go on the final mission, um, that is that ends up becoming a decoy, and you come back, they're all dead, because that was, you know, that's the they couldn't even imply the karma. They had to show it to us right there. Everyone was dead. Oh no, not the Argonian, whatever his name was. <laughs> I think that's a Nord. Shalise? Was that Shalise? No. What was the child's name? Oh, um... Oh, she was the one I... The one person in there that I liked her character. Do you remember the Dark Elf woman? <laughs> she was an elf woman? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm still trying to remember the child's name. Oh, no. What about the old man wizard dude? Uh, I remember he was annoying. I also remember there was a <laughs> werewolf who was married to the head of the sanctuary woman. Yeah, what was his name? Werewolf dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, do you remember the pet spider? I do remember yeah. the pet spider. <laughs> um, Why is the pet spider a more memorable <laughs> character? That's the other problem. Like, everyone well, remembers Cicero, right? You can like or dislike the way Cicero was written. 
but and, everyone remembers Cicero. And you I remember And I remembered Gaston Belafort's corpse. You got to give me that at least. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's another <laughs> character. What's what's um what's oh, anyone fucking name? Who cares? Who gives a shit? It started with a B, I think. A, a B? The, that the, child's the whole character is the entirety of her character is I used to like the Night Mother. That is her entire personality. Babette! Haha! <laughs> Babette! You Google bitch! Don't give me that! <laughs> but her entire personality is I once used to like the Night Mother. And they had one one personality line for her, and they were writing that down, and they were like, This is the best thing I've ever written in my life. Oh, they print it. Okay, who's this guy? Old man wizard dude. I'm, I'm so good at writing characters. He doesn't need another personality. Out the fucking door. Who's this woman? Dark health with bow. She's really good with that bow. Yeah, okay, next. The pet spider for some fucking reason. None of them have depth. You can talk to Marie Antoinette about how she rose, you know, grew up in the streets and about how she escaped that life into a life that she thought was going to be better but ended up becoming worse before she found her family. What the fuck? Where the fuck did that go? Why was Skyrim completely butchered? Like, everyone is a single line. And it's not like the writing in the entire game is that bad. It's it's just the, the Brotherhood, for some reason, just has no depth whatsoever. All of the soul was already sent to Sithis. <laughs> They try to replicate the same feeling from the other Brotherhood. You know, you walk in for the first time and they're all in a circle talking about this story and they're all laughing and it almost looks like human interaction for a little bit. And you think to yourself, oh, maybe, maybe they get it, you know? And then they disperse like automatons bouncing off the walls trying to find their pathfinding. And after you talk to whatever her name is, she's like, oh, go introduce Astrid. yourself to everyone. Astrid, thank you. It's like, go introduce yourself to everyone. And they all have, I don't know, a couple lines about who they are. I am old wizard, dude. I kill things with fire. And then, then they have a one line about how they currently feel about you. Because each one of them has a different way of looking at newcomers. And it's all complex and cool. They're not all happy to see a new family member. No, no. That's too simple. They have to be complex and cool. So the old wizard dude doesn't trust you yet because you're young. Um, the Babette explains to you that she's too old to get attached right now. Um, werewolf dude says he won't talk to you until your fourth mission because he doesn't want to get invested in someone who might die in in a day or two. And it's like, what? What is happening? Is this just a, like a, a a character rundown for a soap opera? I'm I'm not following. Well, and then they and... do like the tropiest trope thing ever, right? Because then, uh, be, before you leave and they all die, you go around. If you go around and talk to them, it's like, you know what? I was wrong about you. Oh You're yeah, they do great. that with every one of them. Whereas in Oblivion, they only do that with the merchant no one remembers exists. I love Mirajdar. Don't even start with <laughs> Whatever. that. Whatever. <laughs> Fucking Khajiit in the corner no one remembers when... he exists. No, no. Mirajdar is great. He's like, get away from me. I, 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 the only reason I am trading with you is because Vicinti told, or Ochiva told me to. But, and, and he does do the thing where it's like, you come back to, to murder everybody in the sanctuary. And he's like, you know, maybe we can start over. But at least at that point, like, it was one person that did that among everybody else who was all like happy and go lucky and stuff. And, um, and, and I did feel bad killing him kind of I, I felt the least bad killing him of everybody but <laughs> at the same time you know he's a he's a member of that family and it, 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 it felt squicky you know yeah it did not feel out of place nor was it overplayed in oblivion uh, it was maybe a little cheeky, you know, like they were making a little bit of fun of it because it was so out of the way. Because you don't interact with him unless you're doing any shopping. So, you know, all of the story happens with the other ones. But yeah, in Skyrim, it, everyone lines up for the, you know, uh, triumphant, you are now a family member after the eight missions. Wow. 
I'm honored. <laughs> I, I have a I have a question for you. I have a question for you. The pet in the Skyrim Sanctuary. Do you remember what it was? I thought it was a spider. Am I wrong? Okay, you know, it is a spider. Because I was thinking it was a rat. But then I realized I was remembering the rat in the Oblivion Sanctuary. <laughs> because the they had a pet yeah. rat. And the, the Skyrim one had the pet spider. Um, so even that, even that I, 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 I misremembered. Whoops. I haven't do, done too much with the Elder Scrolls Dark Brotherhood. Uh, because... The, both the Dark Brotherhood and the Thieves Guild of DLC, uh, in order to progress the storyline, you have to complete dailies, and I just haven't bothered. But when you go and meet your family, um, I remember that they they have pretty some pretty distinct personalities. You have this noble woman who, you know, she's like, oh yes, I was living the high life, and it was all grand, and I was so bored. One day I just murdered my maid, and you know what? I'm happy here now. <laughs> and uh, you have a, a Nord teenager girl who has become a werewolf and is not yet able to control her transformations, and another Nord guy who's like, yeah, you know what? I picked her up after she murdered her family and she was, you know, having trouble, but so we're family now, and now we've joined this family, and it's all great. Uh, and the conflict there is that an actual cult of Akatosh is hunting down the Dark Brotherhood. And that's about as far as I got with it in ESO, because then I got to the point where I have to complete dailies and I haven't bothered. Interesting. Now, Akatosh is essentially the aspect of creation. Uh, so it's, it's funny that he would be at war with the aspect of the Void that that's, that's pretty cool. Well, it's not even like a main body of the Church of Akatosh. It is a legit cult of Akatosh. Like, the, like they are viewed as extremists of Akatosh. <laughs> the AAA? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I would like to do more for them, but I, I have a couple of characters that I'll get to that point eventually. Just my so, my main isn't very good at that sort of thing. She's a healer, and sneaking and murdering is not really her thing. So I think I think my favorite part about the Skyrim Dark Brotherhood is getting Lucian's ghost. Um, <laughs> as the reward for completing one of the quests, you get uh, to it's a, a, a spell summon spectral assassin. And you get Lucian, and he's voiced by Wes Johnson, you know, and he, he's just Lucian, and he is Lucian the ghost, which is interesting to think of a ghost when he was such a devout believer in Sithis that um, you would think that his spirit would be commended to the void and, you know, dispersed into the void. Uh, but he essentially says he, he has stuck around to uh, continue the work of Sithis. So, and uh, he's a follower that you can summon. And if he's killed, you just resummon him. Uh, he has some of the best lines. Like, some of those I do remember. Some of those I've looked up. But uh, the one I do remember was, You wish to kill me? Somebody has already had that honor. <laughs> ah! Um... But he, yeah, you know, he uh, he tells you that he is he, he's remained to just continue the work of Sithis, and he has some of the greatest dialogue. Yet you know, others, when you go back to the sanctuary, it's like what this sanctuary needs is a good purification. But um, Fenbab has a story about losing him as a follower, uh, and it's one of my favorites. Like his, yeah, he, he'll he'll babble occasionally. But he'll go long periods of times without saying anything. And as she was saying, if he dies, you can just resummon him. So it wasn't uncommon for me to just realize he was no, not there anymore. So I remember playing this quest and you know, walking around doing stuff. At some point, I lost him. Don't know what happened. Several hours of gameplay later, 
I happen to walk into the sanctuary to start something else. <laughs> if the fucker starts talking and he scared the shit out of me because <laughs> I'm just walking around and he goes, you know, and I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. A good purification is what this place really needs. And they're like, where did you come from? I didn't summon you. <laughs> Leaky bastard. Well, I guess being a ghost gives them that <laughs> gives them that double advantage, huh? <laughs> and I mean, he can obviously, since he's a follower, he can obviously murder people uh, himself. I'm just reading through some of his other lines, and he talks about Cicero going, "I will kill this jester if you so desire, but there is a disturbance in the void. Our dread father does not wish this." Any disturbance of the void. When I first heard that line, I remember shaking my head, and this was before somehow Palpatine has returned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a disturbance in the force. It was so cheesy. I don't know. It still works for him, kind of, because he was always a very weird character. Everyone in the Brotherhood and Oblivion is so quirky, almost overtly so for him. Um, he just sounds evil. He just sounds evil all the time. It's like an unironically evil all the time. And so it kind of works for him to, to say that. And then you get Shadowmere back, which was his horse in Oblivion. And then uh, you get Shadowmere again in Skyrim. And they're reunit reunited in their dialogue for that, too. And he's like, aw, Shadowmere, my old friend. It's like, aw. But, but it's like the things that I'm remembering that I love the most about the Skyrim Dark Brotherhood are really just callbacks to Oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that we'll, we are almost, we're pretty much at time now. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Background Lore. When we next reconvene, we'll be talking about... Uh, the Argonians and the Hist, and we'll probably uh, talk a bit more about the shadow scales that we uh, kind of touched on a bit here. That we didn't even get to very much, except for <laughs> mentioning them. <laughs> the, the Argonians have an entire episode coming up. The, we can talk about uh, them then. <laughs> that, Cause, that's, that's fine. Because Sithis also does tie in with the Argonians as well, so because they're also big Sithis worshippers when they're not you know all messed up on the hist I mean Sithis isn't just for the Dark Brotherhood Sithis is the void and every every um, religion in Elder Scrolls every culture has this concept of what came before and what came before was Sithis whether or not you venerate that yeah that's a totally different question whether or not you think that this is has any sort of anthropomorphized uh, thing to it or any will to it or want. Um, yeah, that's besides the point. The point is that Sithis is a concept that exists among all religions and all myths for these people. Uh, so it's, it's not, you know, not too out of the, not too out of the way. <laughs> all right. So until next time, uh, hail Sithis. Hail Sithis.